Amen. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right, Acts chapter 5. Do a topical message tonight. We're praying. We do have a lot of families that were out traveling for the holidays, so we're praying for them, as many of them will be traveling back this week with Sean and Krista, the Jordans, the, uh, Brother Thomas, and uh, Sean and Tim. Um, Others that might not be coming to my mind right now, but be praying as many of them will be traveling yet this week. But anyhow, Acts chapter 5, use this as a springboard. We'll be in a lot of different places here this evening. I don't think we'll be too long at all. But let's look at Acts chapter 5 and the event that takes place here in the first several verses. Verse number 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart, that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost... And great fear came on all them that heard these things. The young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Her husband's already dead, buried, funeral's over with. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you have sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the message tonight. Lord, I pray that you use us to strengthen us. Uh, Lord, to help us draw closer to you. I pray that you be glorified. Please control what I say and how I say it, Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has never truly been converted, Lord, I certainly pray for that conviction and that drawing, that perhaps even this evening they'd repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Acts chapter 5, of course, we see back, if you want to listen to a really expository message on this text, just simply go back to our website and listen to it as we go through it, and I even explain why we see the severity of God's chastisement and Ananias and Sapphira with this church at Jerusalem just getting started, and and the steps that God took there, and they were severe. And we're we're dealing with, one of the primary sins that we're dealing here with Ananias and Sapphira is this, There there was pressure to them. You can almost sense it. Now, their walk certainly wasn't what it should have been before the Lord. Um, and, and they see what's taking place with the amount of giving, and they got this property. So they, they, they come up with this plan. They're going to go ahead and sell it, and, and they're going to pretend like they're going to give the entire price like everybody else was doing. They don't want anybody to know that they need to hold back part of the price, which was fine if they did. There's no requirement for them to give all of it. But if they didn't, they wouldn't look as good as everybody else. It would look different. And that pressure to avoid that appearance, they developed a plan. We're going to sell it. We're just going to say it's the whole price. We're going to keep back what we need to keep back. So they go in, and we know the story. We just read it then. They, they go in, Ananias heads in. Peter calls him out on it just immediately. And you could just imagine him hearing it, and there's, there's just nothing you can say. Drops dead. They come in, young men come in, take him outside. And obviously, you can imagine it would take three hours to get buried and everything done. They do all that, they get back in, and Sapphira has already come in after three hours, and they ask her, did you sell the price land for this much? And she agrees with it. And then she finds out her husband's dead, and she drops dead the very next second. They bury her out. They were so worried about appearances. That controlled their decision. 
they attended, which is the first church ever established, the church at Jerusalem. At this time, Peter is the primary leader. James, as we looked at this morning by Acts 15, he's not in place yet. James is there, a member of this church, the Apostle of the Lord, but he's not the pastor yet. He'll be the pastor here shortly. But you still have Peter and the apostles leading this thing. They're there. They're seeing the miracles of God, how God is working. And just like with all churches, they have people at different levels. But this is an example of a couple that was obsessed with appearances to the point that they were willing to sin against God in order to protect how they looked. It was very likely, which we don't know, we don't know everything about. It's very likely, that, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to guess, I don't know, maybe it's 50-50, I don't know any percentages on it. Uh, maybe it was a percentage of, of, of that money that they actually needed. Maybe there was something going on, they knew they had to have that price, yet they were still going to lie to, to cover up, to make it look like they were, they were going to give the entire amount when they were not. Or maybe it was just selfishness. Maybe they're like, you know what, they don't need all this. I need this more than they do. And I see everybody what they're given. They got plenty. And, and, so, and so they determine, <laughs> they determine, you know, what the church needs and what the church doesn't need. And so I, I don't know what drove the motivation behind it. Regardless, though, it was wrong. Not that they, not that they kept back pride. Like Peter told them, you could have. You, you could have said, you know, we did sell it for this amount. We sold it for 50000 We're just going to give thirty. Okay. That's up to you. So there's an element of hypocrisy that is here. Because they were so obsessed with appearances. It led to them following the path of a hypocrite. Of trying to be something that they were not. Regardless of what the motivation was behind it. That's hypocrisy. Now the truth is, all of us, we're not careful. We can all demonstrate hypocrisy in our lives to one degree or another. We all have the exact same flesh. There's probably not a one of us in here who you have paid bills and you have had debt, that you're going through this, that, that, that there's a part of you that, that can sense what Ananias and Sapphira would do you because there's, it's almost like you can see yourself being tempted in that same way. And again, it's so important that walk with God, that it's genuine, that it's true, that when you're faced with those moments, that you have the ability to suppress the flesh and make the right decision. And there's a lot that goes with the walk of the Lord. Let's say they had a genuine need. What would have would helped prevent the hypocrisy, the path of a hypocrite? We have no indication prior to this that there's any hypocrisy in their life. It doesn't give us one verse that says this was a pattern for their life. They had, you know, they, nothing like that. As far as we know, it's the first time, but there was still, regardless, there's an element of them where they didn't trust God. They were going to figure it out. On top of the fact of appearances, we got to maintain the appearance. It's a dangerous place. But we're not careful. All of us can come on in with our mask on. Now, don't get me wrong. I, 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 don't, I don't think for a minute if you've had a, a, a grumpy, bad morning that you come in here all mad and angry at everybody and say, well, I'm not going to be anything different because I don't want to be a hypocrite. No, I, I don't think that's what you should do either. I, I think there should be an element when you come in, Lord, please help me. I'm sorry. Lord, there's other people here that are going to need a friendly smile. Help me to have that. Then it's about the Lord. Your life isn't so much about you it's about God and others. But we have to be careful because all of us can be susceptible to this thing of hypocrisy in our life. So what I want to look at here this evening, and again, I don't think I'll be long. I only have 47 attributes of a hypocrite, I think, altogether. So. But I do want to look at the attributes of a hypocrite scripturally tonight. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7.
Here's one of the attributes that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us about hypocrisy, what can take place. Again, a person doesn't necessarily have to exhibit all these. It might just be one of these or a few of these. But these are, are, are the different traits, if you will, of what hypocrisy looks like, of how the Bible descri describes what's taking place. Verse number 6, he answered and said unto them, <coughs> Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honoreth me with their lips. And this one is the key of all of it. But their heart is far from me. It is that lip service before God. And you know your heart is nowhere near it. That's hypocrisy. This is the case. You have all the termin terminology down. You have the semantics down. You can talk the talk. But you know you're not walking that walk. You know you're not. The people that have that head knowledge of God, that have the words down, that have enough theology down, but they know their heart is what's lacking. The realness. Again, there's a danger. You hear me mention it all the time, and that was one thing I learned in New Guinea. It was so clear. Because there on that island... It didn't take me a year to figure out that how much Christ was simply culture to them and not a reality. Again, I'd have people that literally, that I even have, I videoed myself, would call in wicked spirits and be in a church the next morning and have no problem with it. None. Listen, when your heart is not behind your service, it leads to all kinds of problems in your life. Because all of a sudden now it's about maintaining appearance because it's the culture you know, or because pride is motivating your heart. When that's something you want to come before the Lord and try and get where I say, Lord, please, I need, I need that genuine, that real walk. And, and I'll get, when I finish this up, I want to give some helps for preventing this or dealing with it if it's in our life. This attitude of lip service even carries over when it comes to, you know, we have a local church here where, 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 which is God-ordained. He left this institution behind for the perfecting of the saints. Within that, he's given different offices and positions and gifts all to that end. And from going all the way back here from really prior even to the day of Pentecost, even with Christ himself, what we see taking place, especially after uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the importance of the teaching and the preaching of the word of God, this lip service will carry over into the preaching. Look over in Ezekiel chapter 33. And I'll read this if you're not there already. I might turn these scriptures quickly just, just for time's sake here. Verse 31 of Ezekiel 33 says this, And they come unto thee as thy people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. The key is where your heart is. That's all about appearance. That's all that is. That's all that's about is, is appearance in, in, in verse 31. Look what he says in 32. He describes them even better. And thou art up to them as a very lovely song, one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. I can't. And they hear thy words, but they do them not. Again, it was just about lip service. It, it can affect even here the preaching of the word of God, where it's just, it, there's just, it, it doesn't actually, you don't actually approach it as, uh, as, uh, maybe something the Lord needs to change in your life is something that's real, something you need. <clears throat> Another attribute that the Bible describes for us in different ways of a hypocrite, of a hypocrite, in this one, this one's also huge. So you have the heart, that's foundational. So the heart can really spin off on the rest of these. All right? And and here's one that we saw with Ananias and Sapphira, and that is a false motivation. All right, look over at Matthew chapter 
Here he's talking about the religious leaders there in Israel, Matthew 23, the scribes and the Pharisees that sit in Moses' seat in verse 1. And of course, as you know, we went through this. He really hits the hypocrisy of this group. And I, I'm going to pick out a couple of different parts here. Look at verse 6 and 7. He gets into their motivation of why they really did all these religious works. And he, he's been listing them already, but I'm just going to jump down to verse 6 and 7. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. There's a false motivation here for their service where it's not about God. In this case, let's just put it like this, it's more about their titles, the position. It's what they wanted, the respect that came with it, the notice, the attention. They wanted the titles. The truth is, Many choose to serve God, not to glorify God. Not at all. Not because there's a genuine love for God. Do you understand that many actually choose to serve God for very selfish, wicked reasons? For pride? For title, for notice? For personal gain? We see that taking place it, was that, I believe that deals with the fasting. Uh, let me turn. I wasn't going to turn there, but I think that's fasting. Isaiah, uh, I'm going to have to find it. I hope I can find it. Right. Turn over to Isaiah. Let me see here. I think I know where this is at. I wish I would have wrote that down. Yeah, yeah. Let's start in verse 2. Isaiah chapter 58. This is it. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Sounds, sounds pretty good. Verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye shall find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You should not fast as you do uh, this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. It is such a fast that I have, is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable uh, um, day to the Lord? Is not this a fast that I is not this a fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? This is a tough section right here on him. I mean, here they are, they're going to do this great sacrifice for God, but it's all about self. It's not about the reasons that God intended this to take place. It was about their sacrifice and what they're doing. Boy, it's dangerous. Sometime we can actually begin to serve God and do these different levels of sacrifice for us. For prideful motivations. For personal gain. When it comes to serving God, it's pretty simple. It needs to be done for God. So it's done for him, and he knows, he, he knows that you know, you're, you're doing this for him. The results of that stay with God. It doesn't, that doesn't matter to you all of a sudden. Because you accomplished the goal when it was for God. Matthew chapter 6, we see that some, how this false motivation takes a place in hypocrisy. We see that some others will, uh, they want others to notice and think highly of them. And I've dealt with this a little bit. They do their service, they have their actions, but they make sure others notice. Praying in the, you know, it, when, praying when, the example given there in the streets and letting others see the religious activity. It's not something that's simply between them and God. It's, it's to be noticed. It 
Some can even follow Christ out of outright carnality. Look at John chapter 6. We could tie this into the movement that has taken hold in the last 30, 40 years of the prosperity gospel, which is so easily defeated scripturally. The verses, they're taken out of context and used to justify it. And, and, and the leadership in that movement just absolutely fleecing their own sheep. Oh, that's carnal. But John chapter 6, am I in the right? Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's why that's not looking right to me. Verse number 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Simply falling for carnal reasons. Not because of the power of God, not because of who he is and what he represents and what he was showing. Remember, this is Christ, why the miracles were present, proving he was the Messiah. It wasn't what they were concerned about. Again, just, just demonstrating different parts in Scripture where People serve God for really wrong reasons. Listen, you can, you can actually attend church for some good reasons, but it still doesn't necessarily make it right, and it can lead to a lot of trouble in your life. There, there, are, there are those who might decide, you know, we need to get in church because, you know, we don't want to lose our kids. We want them to have, have them around good influences. That's not a bad thought. Do you understand that? But that's not why you come to church. It's not. You're missing what it's about. <clears throat> Look at Proverbs chapter 11. This is another attribute of a hypocrite. We saw that they will have false motivations for their service. They will have lip service without any action. This one's sad. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. Your influence on others, especially those who are lost. Many in the, those church who are here in the 90s will know who I am referring to. Um, but it was the, I'm not being mean. Everybody who knows it, it's, it's clear as a bell that I have no doubt the fellow would have no problems admitting it brazenly even right now. But we had a member of our church, song leader, everything like that. It happened to be my neighbor. Lived right next door to me in military housing. The, the reality, the hypocrisy became very evident, being a neighbor. We actually had one. He wasn't right next to me. We were in the military townhouses over there in Elmendorf, not far from McDonald's. They're just right around the other side of that playground area. And it looked different. They didn't have all those attached garages back then and all that. The garages were in a whole separate area. And so they were just door after door after door. And so my door, and then we had a neighbor in the middle who's lost, and, and then him. And he had, he had brought out, and he knew we went to church. He knew we went to the same church. We would talk. We would invite. All that took place. There's testimony at stake. We don't know how the Lord was working. Maybe, maybe not at all. Maybe he's just shutting it out completely. I have no idea. We'll never know. But maybe he was close. Maybe he was thinking, maybe I need to try that. I don't know. But I do know this. He brought this old, in his old nasty camper. Wasn't allowed to be there. Been there day after, week after week. Finally, and I happened to be there, the neighbor had said something to him. It wasn't belligerent. He'd just say, listen, you really need to move that thing. And that discussion started going south. Next thing you know, I'm hearing my fellow church member going off, cussing, to the point I'm yelling his name. Stop! He just goes in and slams the door. Know what he did? A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. You have a testimony that's at stake. 
And if you're living the life of a hypocrite, at times it's going to come out. At times it's going to come out. Matthew chapter 7. Last one of these, last one of these. Matthew chapter 7. Now, it's likely in, in fairness, and, and this person I, I know where he's at right now and would even uh, agree with that he was never converted. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verse number 4 and 5. This, of course, is that popular text, the, 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 the one text that everybody in the world likes to quote, judge not that you be not judged, is if they have understanding of what that's talking about. Again, you go back into this series on Matthew that we did and listen to what that is actually talking about. But I want to jump down to verse 4 and 5 of this verse. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Another typical attribute of a hypocrite is this one that can manifest. There is zero self-examination. Zero. They don't fail to see. A lot of people like to say, well, they, they compare the moat in this verse and, and, and the structure up in the beam saying that, well, see, the hypocrite has, has bigger sins, but you'll never find somebody who's using bigger sins that's accusing others. You just don't see it. What it's dealing with is, is the basis here of hypocrisy and the pride that is involved. And how, and how when, when you're at this level of hypocrisy, it's as if you have zero self-examination. As if you do no wrong. But you can see it clearly in others. At least you think you can. You fail to see how your own lack of self-examination actually hinders you from seeing what's going on in the lives of others. Again, they have no problem seeing the faults in others. But they seldom find faults with themselves. They can pick out what's wrong here, what's wrong here, what's wrong here. But the key is, is to use that word of God and step in front of the mirror. They can really lack the ability to recognize their own horrible condition. It's like it's not present. Now, a a few things here just to help us, because all of us have the same flesh. We all can be prone to hypocrisy at one level or another in our life. So what's the cure for it? We know from Matthew chapter 25, we won't turn there for time's sake, but that's, that's the parable of the ten virgins, okay? You get in there, and that, that does give us a truth of one of the obvious cures of hypocrisy, which would have been true in the life of the individual that I gave the example of, and that is there needs to be genuine conversion. Many times, the person just simply isn't saved. And so they're trying to actually live a Christian life without even the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Woo! And then all of a sudden it becomes culture. It will lead, it it almost has no choice. The inevitable end of that, unless conversion takes place, is nothing but hypocrisy. It will lead to that. So for many, they simply need to get saved. They simply need to come to the realization, wait, I've never been converted. Secondly is this. And many times I struggle to put this one in, in words. I have, uh, you know, for years in preaching, but it's just so important. It frustrates me that I can't always put it into the right words and describe the necessity of it. And that is the realness of God. I mean, had Ananias and Sapphira, I, I mean, they were concerned about appearances. But because there was a lack of realness of God, but had, understand, had a realness of God been present in their life, even with all that they've been witnessing, do you understand that, the, that they would have been very concerned about how they appeared before God? But because that wasn't present, they weren't, obviously they weren't walking by faith, it was just by sight because they were worried about those that they could physically see. But boy, when you don't have that realness of God in your life, when it's just a Sunday school lesson, when it's just something you do at church, when there's, not, there's nothing practical about it, 
that, that will affect this. Because then you're, you're, you are so susceptible to being more worried about what others think of you than what God thinks. Then that becomes the motivation. And then that gets out of whack because God can use it when there's a realness of God. God can use it. God can use the idea of accountability with others to actually help us. But boy, if that realness isn't in place, the devil can take that and just swing that into an all-out motivation. What do others think? Pride then can come flying in. You you see, you have something that lacks the realness of God. And they're coming in. It's called to learn how to serve God in different ways. And all of a sudden, follow this. This is, this is just simple logic with how the, and, and how the flesh works. There's not a realness. There's not a genuine true walk. All right? So they're, they're, they're in church. They're serving. And all of a sudden, they do something. And a measure of recognition hits. I don't care who you are, whether it's recognition at your job, in your Air Force, or whatever. We, we like and need to appoint recognition. We do. So think about this, but here's somebody, there is no realness of God. There's not a genuine walk yet. That needs to take place. But somehow it's already put into a measure of service. Recognition hits. He's going to respond to that favorably. It's going to be, whoa, that felt good. The realness of God is there. Know what can happen? All of a sudden, that becomes a motivation. That sets in. Where else can I serve? Notice, it's not because I want to glorify God. It's because I, I had a, a bit of a actually need met in my life through recognition. That then becomes the motivation. The protection against that is that realness of God, being genuine. Remember, one of my favorite texts to preach from that is in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, Paul had very little problems to deal with at that church. It was a great church. It's one of my favorite churches of the church at Philippi. But he is dealing with a few little issues in chapter 4. In the middle of it, he says this, the Lord is at hand. He wants them to listen, God is right there. Don't lose the realness of God. He, he knew that's what's going to control this. That's going to lead this out to the right outcome. It all deals with a heart that's going to draw, that desires to draw close to God. Then lastly, in understanding this, we're not going to turn there, but 2 Corinthians, we, we know the verses, chapter 5, 10 through 14, knowing this, and this is good. This is where the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, comes into play. Knowing this, and it's a fearful thing. It's a reality. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to come. Think about that. Tie that together with what we already learned scripturally here in the last couple years. Think of how John described the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. Think about that. That's fearful in itself. You're going to stand before him. And he knows everything. Everything. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the cure for it is one, many need to be converted. Two, to be real with your walk. It doesn't have to be a super walk. That's not what I'm talking about. We're going to be super Christian. That's not what I mean at all but genuine, real. Allowing your heart to draw close to God, and I believe also a reality is knowing judgment is coming. It is. As a Christian, we will be judged for our works. And as the Bible tells us, multitudes of us are going to have our works burned up. The motivation was wrong. God knows everything. He does. But could you imagine, I mean, it's scary, it is. It brings tears to your eyes. Could you imagine knowing all that he did for you, and you're seeing him there, 
God becoming man, taking your sin, giving you his righteousness. You're in heaven with him. He's judging you. There's all your works you think you have, and they're gone, burned up. Because it wasn't for him. It was for you. That's, think about it, that's entering eternity like that. Then you understand why the Re- book of Revelation says there are tears wiped away in heaven, because there are. Tears have to be wiped away. Those aren't tears in hell. Those are tears in heaven. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, this message certainly was for Christians, but maybe you're here. I want you to think about this question. If you die right now, where would you go? If your soul departs your body this evening, is it going to heaven or is it going to hell? It's going to one or two places. It's not going to fall asleep. It's going to one of two places. It will go right into the presence of the Lord or it will go right into a very real place called hell. Where is it going? The answer to knowing the assurance of that is found in the word of God through what Jesus Christ did for you because you will die. You will be judged of God, the Bible says. In Hebrews chapter 9, 27, you will die and he will judge you. He will judge you based upon his law. Romans chapter 2 teaches that. So you will stand before God in judgment. You will be judged based upon his law, and you have broken his law just like I have. All of us are guilty. Something has to take place where you look perfect, but none of us are. That's the amazing thing about God and his grace and his love. So what he did to make you look perfect was he himself became a man. God the Son becomes a man 2,000 years ago. He lives on this life the perfect life as a man. Now, there's a man that's lived on this earth who can go to the judgment day and the Father can say, you're innocent. The only one who's ever done it. He's it. He lived that perfect life, though. Don't miss this. For you. When he went to the cross, he literally took your place in judgment. God the Father judged him for your sins. The Bible says, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He judged him for your sin. He made it look as if he was the transgressor. And at the same time, he gives you his perfect life. Because the rest of the verse says, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he gives you his perfect life, and he takes your transgressions. The Father judges him in your place. That satisfies justice. But because Jesus is God, after three days and three nights, hell doesn't hold him. He defeats death and rises again from the dead. Listen, you have to come to him in repentance and faith, and he will save you from that judgment. Is there any here that say, Pastor McGovern, please, I need that. Maybe you've been struggling with your salvation for several months, several weeks, several years. You say, Pastor, please, I'm not sure that I am converted. I hear you. Please pray for me. I think I might need that. Just raise your hand for me where I can see it. Anybody here like that at all? I see some of our small children. That's all I'm seeing. If you did put your hand up, I missed it. I would need you to do it again. All right, Christian. Floor work on your hearts tonight. You come and pray. Father in heaven, bless this invitation, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Page 174, if you need to come and pray this evening, you come and pray.